Hi, I'm Elsa Youngstead with the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center. Evolution is not just a list of examples in your textbook. It's a dynamic field that biologists are working to understand every day. Right now, we're standing in front of the Biological Sciences Building at Duke University. This is where Elizabeth Derryberry works. She's a graduate student in the lab of Steve Nowicki, and she wants to understand the factors that lead to isolation between populations and the formation of new species. Specifically, she studies how changes in birdsong can lead to reproductive isolation. Let's start with some background. What is the question that you want these birds to help you answer, and how does it fit in the big picture of evolutionary biology? One of the big questions in understanding speciation is how do barriers arise between populations? And these can arise through sort of genetic drift or selection by populations becoming more different from each other, such that when they come back together and they mate, that their offspring are not as viable. And that's usually referred to as sort of post-zygotic barriers, um, in which case it means that the offspring themselves are not fertile. Um, but another form that's particularly prevalent in birds is behavioral barriers to gene flow, such that when populations come back together, they actually don't recognize the mating signals of the other population. And that can be through changes in plumage coloration, uh, changes in their songs. So something breaks down behaviorally. And so one of the big questions, uh, particularly looking at avian speciation, is how do these behavioral barriers form over time? And one of the ways that people have looked at this is to look at how um, both males and females respond to songs from different populations. So how do they compare songs of their own population to songs of different populations? And studies typically look at both males and females because song is what we call um, a dual function signal. So it has two functions. It has, in, and both functions are in reproductive context. So they, they have implications for fitness. Um, so one context is male-male competition. So males sing a song, um, often from their territory, it's a prevalent form, and they sing this song and it's a way of announcing that this is their territory, this is their resource. And it's a way of keeping rival males off. So that's the male-male function. Um, and then the other function is male-female. So males sing to attract females, and that's one of the things we're particularly interested in. So can they, do females both recognize that male as a member of their own species that they will mate with, and also does it sound like a good male? Is this going to be a quality mate? Because that's a lot of investment you're making when you choose a mate. So what I did um, was I said, well, it's very interesting what we found from these studies of response to geographical variation in song is that males and females of many, many species prefer their local song over songs from other populations. But why is that? And one of the big questions that people are starting to look at is do they not prefer that non-local song because selection has acted you know, to, for them to discriminate against it? Like that would be a bad mate. Or is it that um, they don't respond to these non-local songs because for some reason they don't sound like a local song. They don't sound right. So it's not specifically selection against them to ignore that individual as a mate. But more it's, um, it's a process of selection within the population and that individuals are picking songs based on some criteria and a non-local song falls outside of that criteria. What's really great about bird song is that we have um, historical recordings. So people got really interested in recording birds back in the 60s. That's when equipment started to become available to make high quality recordings. This is a good time to sort of go back and look at those songs and say, have they changed since the 60s? Can we see change over this short period of time? And if they have changed, have they changed enough that individuals in the population no longer recognize them as mating signals. So that's sort of what I was hoping to do is by looking at it within a population, I isolate it from any sort of geographical effects. So I'm looking specifically at change over time. Does evolution of a mating signal affect its salience, 
So whether or not males and females recognize it as a good mating signal. And so when they sing their song, uh, most white crown sparrow songs, they start with a whistle. So one pure tone um, that's relatively brief, but it's at one frequency. And then this is followed by a series of complex notes, uh, which means that there's several notes put together in sort of a musical sounding way. And then usually at the end of their song, they produce what is called a trill, which is a series of repeated notes of the same, repetition of the same note. And this is very simple sounding and almost like machine gun fire. Do, 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 do. How do you actually measure the difference between old and new songs? Is it just a matter of listening, or are there computers and math involved? So if you listen to these songs, you can hear the differences. And it's pretty remarkable because people who don't usually listen to bird song are like, well, I probably wouldn't be able to hear it. You know, it's just these subtle acoustic differences, but they're pretty clear. Um, the, first we the first whistle sounds lower, and the song does sound overall slower. It's harder to hear that difference in bandwidth unless you get a particularly good ear. So then what we do is we can measure these differences. So we actually use a program called Signal. There's many different acoustical software packages. And what you essentially do is put the song into a computer. Through dig you, know, you can digitize it. And then do what we call fast Fourier transform analysis. What this essentially does is it makes a sound into a picture. So you can look at it on a computer screen. And you can take frequency measures and you can take uh, time measures. So when does the song start? How long is that whistle in milliseconds? You know, how fast is that trill? You, know, you take measurements of how long each note is um, and then average that and look at how fast they're delivering these. Um, you can take a measurement of the, the highest frequency. So you can see the song and take a measurement. And so what I found was in White Crown Sparrows, over time in Tioga Pass, that initial whistle has lowered in frequency, and that end part, the do 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 has gone, has slowed down, so it's become more slow. Um, and the bandwidth of that trill has increased. And by bandwidth, what I mean is the difference between the highest frequency in that note and the lowest frequency, so sort of the frequency range that they're singing in. So this was really interesting, because what I found was the song type, the note types in that, in that particular order had not changed over time, but they sounded different. So it was almost like they were singing a cover of a song. So it's the same words, the way we think of a cover. So it's the same words, um, but it's delivered with that band's musical style. So they use the same sort of basic foundation, but it sounds different. And what I was interested in is, well, well that's really different from their geographical variation song. So each population has a different song. And over time, what's happening is the cover of that song is changing, but not the actual song type. So if the change over time doesn't look like what's happening between populations, maybe individuals don't recognize that change. So that's how this started off. I had measured these changes, and my advisor said, well, it doesn't matter if it's changed if they don't recognize it's changing, right? It's not meaningful. So you need to go find out if this is meaningful. So that's how you measure the difference between songs. What tests did you use to find out if the birds could also tell the difference between old and new songs? So I did two tests. Uh, one test was with males and one test was with females, again, because there's a dual function in song. And so in males, what I wanted to know was if I played, when I played these songs on their territories, was this an aggressive signal? Did they recognize this as an intruding male on their territory? And so what I did was I played the historical song or I played a current song. Each male heard one example of each of those. 
so that I could compare his response between those two songs. And you do this sort of design because males, um, there's variation in their aggressive behavior, much like human males. So there's some that are very passive and don't respond as strongly, and there's some that are so, you know very worked up and they're gonna say exactly how they feel. So with males, you have to compare within a male his response in order to get, um, because it, it wouldn't really make as much sense to compare across males. So what I found was, males approached the speaker where the song was playing from more closely during the playback of a current song than they did during the playback of an historical song. So what this suggests is that a current song is recognized as a more aggressive signal. They're seeing that, they're hearing that as a more aggressive signal um, than an historical song. So that suggests that males can tell the difference between current songs and historical songs, and that an historical song is less salient. So it's less, it's not performing as effective of a function in communication. So then with females, it's a little bit different. Uh, testing females is harder. They, um, what you want is an understanding of how, whether they recognize this song as a mating signal. And so what I did is I took females into the lab and they each got their own little cage and they heard each song. So I played them an historical song or a current song again, compared within a female, because some females were much more interested in finding a mate than other females. And what I did was looked at how many times they performed um, this behavior that's an indicator of whether or not they want to mate. So it's called a copulation solicitation assay. When they hear the song, almost immediately, they arch their back and form a U shape. So both their head and their tail go up. And it, so it sort of looks like this. And then they, we, they wave their wings very rapidly. So it's almost like the whole little bird is vibrating. And it's, so it's a very active display and it's very hard to miss. It's very clear. And it's, um, and you see this out in the field too. So it's very clearly something that they do usually early in the breeding season when they're trying to find a mate. And it's essentially a stereotyped behavior. Um, that's a way of saying, yes, I like you. And so what I did is saw, looked at how many times they performed these, this behavior during the playback of a current song versus during a playback of an historical song. And they gave more of these behaviors during current songs. So what that suggests is that they can tell the difference between a current and historical song, so these changes are meaningful, and that an historical song is less attractive to them. They prefer the, the current song over the historical song. So what's interesting is that they, both males and females responded to the historical song. So this is clearly, they see this as a song of their own species. It's not completely ineffective. So they, they would mate with this individual, but what it says is that the current songs are more effective than the historical songs. So these changes have had meaningful consequences in these sort of reproductive contexts. But you persevered, you got your birds, you finished the experiment, and you found the result that the new songs are more interesting to the birds than the old songs. So how does that fit in with your original question of how reproductive barriers form between populations? So the response that I found to songs over time is it's important to place it in the context of response to songs over geographical space. And so what, to remind, um, what's been found is that males and females both tend to respond more strongly to songs of their own population than to songs of non-local populations. And what I've shown is that males and females respond more strongly to current songs than they do to historical songs. So there's two implications. The first is that this weaker response to historical songs and weaker response to non-local songs, songs suggests that what's occurring in populations over time is contributing to isolation between populations. So this is sort of like a confirmation of what was thought to occur. So what's been suggested is that change over time within populations contributes to isolation between populations. But this had not been tested directly with bird songs. So it was a confirmation of that. And then the second point, uh, which applies more to what's occurring in white crowns, is that these changes over time are in acoustical features, 
But what's different among populations is the song type. And so what had been thought was that you had to have these different types to act as barriers between populations. That somehow when a new song type arises, that is an effective barrier. What this work shows is that just changes in that song type, more subtle acoustical changes, also contribute to forming a barrier. So this could have implications for um, that story I was telling earlier, which is that selection, it doesn't seem to be that individuals are necessarily being selected against to, to discriminate against different song types. But it's more that individuals are responding most strongly to current variation and anything outside of that, even their own song type, acoustically, anything acoustically outside of current variation, uh, even of their own song type, is less salient. It's less effective as a mating signal. So it suggests that we need to be looking, particularly in this system, at how, more, how individuals respond to more subtle differences and what these may mean. So the future would be with this is to say, well, if they respond less to historical, what is it about that song? Are females listening to how they produce that trill at the end, the do 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 Or is it something about the whistle, the frequency of the whistle? So these more subtle changes, how do males and females respond to it? So we need to break down the song and say, what are the cues that are in that song?